Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Sabrina Kofer, and on behalf of CHOICE and ACRL, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Leveraging AI Innovations to Improve Student outcome, Outcomes, which is sponsored by Clarivate. This session is one in a series of sponsored webinars from CHOICE and ACRL that addresses new ideas and developments of interest to the academic library community. Now I'll just put a couple links in the chat for where you can register for upcoming webinars and watch previous webinar recordings. Also, if you're interested in library technology, uh, LibTech Insights or LTI is a content vertical from Choice that examines the day-to-day -day impact of library and education technology on academic librarianship and higher education. The channel provides practical guidance on technology trends and products as they relate to productivity, accessibility, content management, and more. You can find out more about LTI and sign up for the newsletter uh, via the links in the chat. Okay, so before we get started, I'd like to point out just a few features of the webinar software. All attendees who join the presentation are automatically muted and your cameras are off, so don't worry about generating any noise or feedback. We've got that taken care of for you. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. To adjust the size of the slides or video, you can use the divider in the middle of the screen to slide the sizes to your liking. We are using the Q&A feature today. Please use it to ask questions of our speakers or to share any comments. We do anticipate many questions, so if we don't get to yours, we apologize for that, uh, but we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. So please do type your questions into the Q&A module as they occur to you. You can also use the upvote feature to highlight questions you like or would like to be addressed. Also, there is closed captioning available for today's session. To toggle the automated captions on or off, please use the CC button on the bottom panel of your screen. Last, please note that we are recording today's program, and everyone who registered should receive, <clears throat> excuse me, should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archive version. And with that, we are ready to get started. So I will hand it over to Christina. Good morning. Good afternoon and good evening, everybody. I'm delighted to be here today to talk about how to leverage AI innovations to improve student outcomes. My name is Cristina Blanca Sancho and I work on the academic AI product management team at Claribay. Presenting with me today will be my colleagues, Stephen Kemsley, senior manager in our user experience design group, and Stuart Beach, Director of Product Management on our books team. So I would like to start the session today talking about Clarivate's approach to AI tools for academia. At Clarivate, our belief is that we have an important role to play in designing and applying gen AI tools responsibly because we are part of the academic community. We are committed to providing tools that institutions and users can trust to be transparent about the opportunities and risks of Gen AI, and as always, to rigorously follow academic principles and standards. That's why we aim to provide customers with more opportunities to uphold research integrity, advance pedagogical practices, and develop students' learning skills. But let's talk for a minute about the specifics of what Clarivate is doing regarding the use of Gen AI. Our strategy is based on three different pillars. The first one is that we are adding Gen AI to existing solutions, which means doing similar things to what we have been doing so long, but doing them better and faster thanks to AI. But these are truly more than just enhancements. It's about new capabilities and new use cases within our existing product offerings, such as Web of Science, eBook Central, the Progress Platform, and Library Discovery. Think about new ways of doing discovery using natural language search, for example. Our second pillar is about transforming with Gen AI. And we do that via the creation of new services and tools that we couldn't build before. It's about imagining and implementing new solutions to all challenges. 
take, for example, academic coach from Alicia, which supports student content engagement. Alicia is flipping the common use of tools such as ChatGPT, because instead of the user asking the chatbot the questions, it is the chatbot that is asking the questions of the student and guiding them through the reading process. Finally, our third pillar is about increasing efficiencies. And this applies both to increasing customer efficiencies and productivity, as well as improving our own backend processes. And a good example here is using GenAI, for example, to enrich metadata consistently and at scale. So in order to support these pillars, advance our academic portfolio and to support multiple use cases at scale, we've developed an academic AI platform. It's designed to help us bring existing and new use cases to the market faster. The platform allows us to deliver more capabilities and solutions, all with a consistent user experience and at a scale. And we're doing all of that using a set of assets and competencies that are unique to Clarivate, such as our authoritative content, our ability to embed the tools in the user's workflow, our expertise in AI technologies, our close partnership with the academic and publishing communities, and our strong commitment to responsible AI. The Clarivate Academic AI platform is built to support multiple use cases. So it delivers core capabilities like conversational discovery, document insights, visualization, metadata generation, analytics, and much more. And it does that consistently and at a higher scale across our AI products and content operations. One of the key advantages of the platform is the ability to deliver a safe and secure environment that enhances privacy and data security and optimizes access to LLMs for our various product teams. But it's much more than just a technical infrastructure. We've built a brand new team around it to create an AI center of excellence with strong LLM stewardship because this core team supports our various product teams in using AI responsibly strong governance to ensure respect for copyright, intellectual property, and privacy. And we are also working closely with our community by engaging with our AI advisory council to share insights, evaluate results, gather feedback, address problems with inaccuracies and bias, and share best practices. Working with customers, and the library community, we've identified four main use cases where the use of AI can be of significant help. So we're focusing on this right now. The first one is the research assistant. So these are the tools that help users with their day-to-day -day research. And we have two different types of tools here. We have the discovery assistant, which are those that support the task of finding the information in a conversational way. And then we have the document insights, which helps users with the understanding of individual documents. Then we have the metadata assistants, which are more targeted at librarian cataloging personas. So when you have physical records, the metadata assistant can help you extracting useful metadata for cataloging. And when you have digital files, we can use the assistant to generate metadata from scratch or to help you find similar documents and cluster them together. So the value here really is that we can increase the speed and the quality of the cataloging with the assistance of AI, which ultimately improves discovery in the research process. We always keep the librarian at the center because their expertise is still very much needed but we're simply providing them with tools that allow them to better apply their expertise and automate some of the more mundane tasks of their role. 
The third use case we have here is the analytics assistant, which um, for us has three main capabilities. The first one is a conversational discovery experience, but instead of uh, conversing with documents, you are conversing with structured or analytical data. So you can ask questions and interact with charts and tables, or you can even create new charts based on the existing data. We also think that we can use this to provide important recommendations and insights into future steps, future collaborations, perhaps funding opportunities, maybe helping understanding emerging trends in a more intuitive and natural way. And lastly, we can use the analytics assistant to create narratives from this structure analytical data which can be used to build profiles for grant applications, for example, or understand more deeply the societal impact of research. The last use case we have here is the image assistant, which is going to support libraries with the management of their digital assets. And we're doing that by, on the one hand, providing them with a metadata system on the back end to help with the cataloging, while at the same time offering discovery capabilities on the front end to facilitate the exposure of these collections to their end users. On this slide, I would like to highlight the main differences between a general purpose LLM and academic AI at Claribate. So on the left, you have the traditional LLMs, those that have been trained, using data that could be accessed freely uh, in, with inverted commas on the web. Although we don't know exactly what that is because these providers are being very secretive and not very transparent about it. But however, these systems are really very good at understanding patterns, create text, create images, uh, providing translations, and those are just a few common use cases. They follow the usual pattern of asking a question using natural language, which goes to the pre-trained LLM, and then getting the output based on that training data that we don't really know where it's coming from. And this is significantly different to what we're doing at Claribate. We don't have our own LLM, uh, we're not training LLMs with the data we license from publishers. We use pre-trained models within the Clarivate AI platform secure environment. The key difference here being that we are adding an additional step in the process called retrieval augmented generation, or you might have heard of it um, uh, referred to as RAG. RAG help us ground the output of the LLM on the trusted facts and information that you would usually find in Clarivate academic products. And this minimizes substantially the chances of obtaining wrong facts, what we call hallucinations or biased responses. And we're doing this by sending our content as part of the instruction to the AI tool. So the content is part of the prompt to ensure that anything that we get back from the LLM is based on that content and not the undefined training data from the LLM. It's worth pointing out also that the LLMs we use never get to see the content that we send them. So they can't use, they can't use it for training purposes either. At Claribate, we remain fully committed to our core principle, which is keeping research and learning integrity at the heart of everything that we do. Because it's all about providing trusted solutions in a transparent way and doing so responsibly together with the academic community. So unlike general Gen AI tools like ChatGPT, we present users with information that is based on our trusted curated academic content. It does not guarantee uh, that there won't be any errors, but we do evaluate, test, and validate results carefully to minimize the risks. 
We also make sure that customers can best benefit from their existing content subscriptions by providing innovative AI tools within a secure and private environment. We collaborate very closely with publishers and have clear definitions of permitted uses of their content so that we can provide the best experience to end users while protecting the content from our partners. Also, we ensure proper attribution and citation of works so that users can explore and access documents from the library and reference them accurately in their work. But as we know, um, AI comes with risks and challenges, and there are many legitimate concerns that we should be aware of, such as the possibility of bias, hallucinations, research integrity issues, environmental impact. That's why we engage with the community via our AI advisory council and our beta programs in order to work together to address those concerns. This allows us to get the critical feedback that we need in order to ensure that our products are developed in ways that are both valuable and aligned with academic values. This feedback helps us adhere to ethical AI principles, basically. And because customer feedback is so important to us and with the goal of getting even more feedback, we launched our Pulse of the Library Survey earlier this year. Over 1,500 responses uh, were received from across the world, uh, representing academic, national, and public libraries. The key findings that we discovered were that, first of all, over 60% of the libraries have some sort of AI plan or are working on one. The AI adoption is the top priority for technical teams, according to 43% of the respondents. Um, finally, the participants made it very clear that the top concerns they see are the AI skills gap and budget constraints. Respondents were more worried about those two aspects than about privacy and security issues, actually, which was interesting. Another of the questions in the survey was about the main objectives that libraries had for implementing AI technologies. And here, the results, uh, and here are the results from our survey. But what we, what we would like to do uh, is actually get your feedback and your thoughts about this. Uh, so you should have seen a poll popping up on your screen, and it would be great if you could respond to the poll um, uh, and spend a couple of seconds doing that. What we found out from our poll and from those 1,500 uh, respondents is that uh, the main goal for 52% 50 of, the, of the respondents was to support student learning. 47% mentioned research excellence and 45% mentioned content discoverability. This means that AI is actually advancing the library's mission because the main goals for implementing AI tools are closely aligned with it. So how are we doing with the poll? Did we get some, yeah, we got in, we getting some responses and yeah, nice to see that it kind of mirrors um, what we saw in the survey. That's great. That's excellent, guys. Thank you for filling that in. So the survey includes many other insights that I couldn't cover today because of time concerns, but um, I think you will find it very interesting. So I encourage you to search for Clarivate Pulse of the Library and get the full report from our website. And uh, with that, I'll pass on the mic now to my colleague, Stephen, who will talk about the impact of AI on libraries and students. Thanks, Christina. Um, so I'm Stephen Kemsley again. I work in uh, user experience. So my job is basically to understand our, our customers and our users and to make sure that their perspectives and needs guide the, the products that we develop. So um, yeah, today I'm excited to be here and share some of the research that we've done this year to inform some of the 
strategy that Christina just mentioned around AI. Um, so this year, our, our user experience team has been trying to answer a big question, and that's how have some of the momentous changes of the past several years, you know, the pandemic, AI, many other factors, how have those affected this, the experience of students and faculty and librarians in higher education? Um, so to that end, we contacted over over 300 people. Uh, we had about 40 interviews and the rest of were surveys that we ran. Um, and so I'm gonna cover some of the key findings from our research. Um, before getting into some of the findings specific to AI, however, I'd like to step back a bit by talking about some of our broader findings. So this isn't the focus of this presentation, and certainly I could, I could probably fill an hour on just a couple of these points, but it's, I think it's important to mention them and to paint a picture of the environment in which AI arose. Um, so a big part of our research was just understanding the trends even outside of AI. Overall, instructors, librarians, and students themselves told us about the headwinds that students are facing. Um, so first and foremost, at the top there, you'll see that financial and time pressure is a key thing that uh, almost everyone mentioned. Uh, the two elements being, of course, related. Uh, the quote on the top right um, from a community college instructor really speaks to that, um, how our students used to have 10 to 20 hour jobs and now they have 30 to 40, 50 hour jobs. Um, and that creates you know, tremendous pressure for, for students as they're working on their studies. We also heard a lot about mental health challenges. Of course, um, many assume that this is a knock-on effect of the pandemic, although there's many other factors at play. And you know, both financial time pressure, mental health issues, these are echoed in many reports throughout the past several years by news and um, researchers. And as you, as you can imagine, these were assumed to be affecting a lot of other trends that we're seeing. For example, there's uh, many spoke to us about a transactional approach that they're seeing in education from some students. When you're working and going to school and you're paying a lot to do that, um, you're gonna wanna make sure you're getting your money's worth. Uh, and while there's easier access to te technology as a result from the changes that were made necessary by remote learning during the pandemic, uh, we're hearing reports of lower engagement uh, in class lower skills coming into college and university and a more, and again, that transactional approach. Now this isn't necessarily, not all of these are seen from every interview that we conducted, but there were enough of a trend that um, it seemed to be, you know, across many different institutions and many different people mentioned this. Now, I wish I could spend more time here. Um, if you're interested in learning more, we certainly have a longer presentation about that, including one we did earlier this year with the choice in ACRL, which you can find online. Uh, and you can also contact us, I'm sure, after. For now, I'm going to move on and get into research, some challenges facing research, which I think relate to the challenges that we're trying to address with AI. So we asked students in a survey, uh, which what was the single biggest challenge across a list of you know, related research tasks? And we found challenges you know, across the process from choosing your topic to writing a paper. Um, now, everyone in the audience, I'm sure will not be surprised by some of these. The writing a paper has always been, is, has always been hard and always will be unless you, know, you have AI writing it for you. Um, what was interesting to me was that no one, no task got more than 16% um, and that the challenges are, are varied across individuals. So pretty much spread out across a lot of the research process, but they are kind of clustered in the first two stages here. And we know from student interviews throughout the years how hard it is to get started on research and not just for students for any researcher. Um, it was also interesting to me that collaboration came out as a one of the, the biggest challenges. We also asked, you know, using the same stages of research, we asked students where they use AI currently in the research process. Um, and here we find that many use it to help choose a topic, for example, learn about a subject. And that's 
That's great because AI is great with coming up suggestions like this, perhaps not surprising. Also, it's intuitive to me that, intuitive to us that it helps with things like grammar and spelling. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's good at doing things like that. It's been good for many years, like Grammarly, not even just generative AI, but just AI tools that have been around for a long time. Um, I think perhaps most interesting to, to us was, you know, finding sources of information was rated so highly since, as we mentioned already, you know, we know the problems AI has inventing sources of information, sometimes inventing um, quotes or inventing citations. So it's perhaps it's a problematic use of AI in some ways, but it's it's a way that people are, are students are currently using it. And you know, by comparing these two graphs going back and forth between the challenges and and how AI is used, we can we as a, a user experience team we can look for gaps where maybe there's challenges where AI isn't isn't used where we could help, um, and this helps guide some of our thinking and, and feature development. Um, we also asked uh, how frequently students are using AI to help with school and research. And we find that while most students say that they use AI at least sometimes, um, only 21% there on the on the left say they never use it. Um, there's a big spread on how often it's used, about 35% if I had the four and the fives up there, said so they say that they use it frequently or all the time. Um, and there's you know a big mix of, in between. I think there's probably several reasons for this mixed level of use. Uh, for one, only half the students we asked said that they were confident in using it. <clears throat> so they might know how to ask, you know, um, ask it how to, you know, write a, a poem in the, uh, in the in the voice of Edgar Allan Poe, but they might not know how to use AI to, you know, effectively use it for research for a school project. Um, additionally, about, you know, half of the students that at least know what their school's policy is on AI. So the AI is restricted. So the restrictions might be playing a role too. And lastly, I assume this is kind of a hunch that even if uh, students may be reluctant to admit even in an anonymous survey that they use AI for school because there are some stigmas against it. Um, we did talk to students and here are some comments from them about using AI for school. On the right, you can see some of the challenges that some of the um, reasons why they might not use it, which I just touched on. So um, there's concerns about plagiarism, um, the fact that it could be prohibited at a university. They don't want to even touch it because it could impact their grades. Um, and then there's some comments about how, you know, they want to do the work themselves um, and they don't want AI to do, do it for them, which is, you know, always a heartening thing to see. Um, on the left, we see why some of the, the positive aspects of AI. So it's fun. Uh, it saves them time. Uh, you think back to the time pressures I mentioned earlier, and you can see why something that saves time would be appealing. And that's, you know, indeed like the main reason that a lot of people use it is because it can do things faster. And then going through an entire document, you can summarize it in, in two seconds, and maybe that helps you get to a quicker evaluation of, of whether it's worth your time. Now I'm going to switch a little bit to the concerns, um, concerns and benefits that that we heard from our interviews with faculty and librarians, and starting with some of the concerns, uh, some of the key some key factors emerged, and you'll recognize these from what Christina mentioned before. Um, these interviews help to inform our strategy and uh, understand what the concerns were out there, making sure we're focusing on the things that um, are the are the primary concerns out there. So. One is credibility. So it's it's one thing to you to get a, a hallucination or an incorrect answer when you're just asking a kind of a harmless trivia question. Um, if it gets wrong, no, no big deal, right? Um, but in the context of your school work, um, that's a big problem, right? If you're quoting a quote that doesn't exist, or if you're quoting a source that doesn't exist, or inaccurate information. That can affect your grade. That can affect uh, how well you do in your program, in your graduation. So it's a much bigger deal uh, in the context of academia. Uh, inclusivity is the second point. So 
there's a great quote from one of our interviewees on this. So it brings in AI brings in all the biases that it was trained on, um, which are plenty, and accidentally creates a lot of exclusion. It makes it harder to find content outside of the AI highway. I love that that framing of it. Um, so perhaps AI, you know, does it focus on the you know the expected, the most popular, what's already the most popular viewpoint? Does it exclude some of these um, more interesting or um, less popular viewpoints that sometimes are, you know, where researchers really want to to focus on those less explored viewpoints? Does AI make it harder? This is a big concern. And um, underrepresented voices might might have a harder time standing out in such an environment. Transparency. The third point is is definitely huge. It, it's a big category. This is like how how are how is our users' data being used? How are the models being trained? What's the impact on the environment? Um, before you know, we're, we've been hearing from librarians. Before I can recommend a tool, I need to know the answers to all these things. Because I'm getting asked by students and, and faculty and others that these questions. I need a credible answer. So, um, for us, being transparent is is really important because it's important to you. And lastly, there is a desire to see AI used in a healthy and educational way. So students are, are at school to learn. And if AI does it for them, they won't learn. So how can, and AI is not going away, right? So how can we use AI in a way that benefits their learning rather than taking away from it? And that's that's always the, um, the thing we're trying to balance, you know, when we're developing these features, AI features is provide enough benefit that it saves time and addresses some of those challenges that, that students are facing but that doesn't take away from their education and perhaps imparts a few skills along the way. Um, moving on to some positive aspects of AI. Um, before I get into this, I should note that there's another poll that's gonna be brought up here. So if you could spend uh, a few seconds about uh, on that poll, it's gonna be up for about 30 seconds. Um, so I'll end on uh, some of the positive benefits that our interviewees saw with AI, that AI can provide. So uh, they, they thought it was especially useful when it acts as a sort of assistant. So like I said, not doing the work for, for students, but helping them develop their ideas, helping them with outlines, helping them develop their arguments. Um, maybe Having the, having the AI evaluate a work in progress gives some constructive suggestions. So maybe some of the activities that, that any tutor or, or librarian or helper might might do when they, if they were sitting next to a student. And while you know our participants said that AI can't really replace the assist the quality of assistance you can get from a human assistant, it can perhaps provide some initial help to those um, that you know the library might not be able to reach. Or um, you know they might not have time, um, so it, it it was seen as a it can be an an enabler to help students develop some research skills without you know replacing um, the human touch and human assistance. So with that, I'm going to wrap up and pass it on to Stuart, who's going to discuss our approach for integrating some. Uh, powerful AI tools into eBook Central. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. Um, so just as a reminder, um, my name is Stuart Beach. I'm a director of product management at Clarivate. And um, my area of interest, uh, my area of responsibility is eBook Central. And so you've heard today from Christina on our AI strategy, our academic AI strategy, and obviously from Stephen, um, it's the research that's been done into um, library and student needs, uh, our understanding of library and student needs. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is what does this mean for one of our platforms, uh, obviously my interest, um, what does this mean for our ebook platform, ebook central, uh, and the books that we host? So what we've been looking at is what's the best way that we can help students and researchers in their use of ebooks? Uh, how to help them gain a better understanding of the material that they need to use, be it for a specific uh, 
specific task, a specific assignment, or perhaps their wider research as they move through their research career. Uh, obviously, we recognize that for some students, they'll maybe only read a few pages of a, of a chapter, let alone a few pages of the whole book, uh, much as we'd like to think that they do read entire chapters or entire books. So with that in mind, we want to try and encourage them to actually to encourage students, encourage researchers to engage more with the content that we provide, that you as librarians have provided to your patrons, um, and provide connections through to other material that's been that we host that is provided as part of uh, a customer's holdings. So we're seeking to provide a, uh, a research assistant, as has been outlined um, previously. Uh, we'll provide AI generated insights within that research assistant at the chapter level within a book. Uh, that'll help with the evaluation of the, the content of, uh, of each chapter. And as we say, encourage the user to engage more with the book spend more time in it, uh, actually kind of understand the value um, of the book. Um, those insights are gonna be contextual. They're gonna be drawn from within the chapter. Um, and we've already spent time today talking about kind of our structure of our LLMs, um, the queries that we're sending, the responses that we're sending back. We wanna make sure that we're not providing information from external sources in order not to confuse um, confuse students in their use of the content to run the risk of biases or uh, hallucinations. But it's also something that's an important consideration for our publishers, the publishers that we work with. They want to make sure that any AI, um, AI responses are drawn solely from within the book that is being used, that it's not a, um, an accumulation, a conglomeration, if you like, of content from other sources. It needs to be specific to that book and to that chapter. Uh, so I say, we want to encourage greater engagement with the content, greater engagement with each book, um, guide the student, the researcher to more in-depth reading, uh, and provide connections to other relevant books. So how are we going to achieve that? I'd like to provide just some illustration of what we're seeking to do later this year. So once this launches um, later this year, early next year, certainly in a couple of months, it's going to be freely available within eBook Central uh, for our customers and their patrons. It's going to be available on the majority of books that we host. There are going to be some publishers that will uh, that will want to opt out because AI doesn't fit in with their strategies, but we'll certainly make it as as available as we can do across the range of books that we host. As mentioned, it's going to provide AI insights um, easily accessible for any patron. Um, and it will also contain some curated features. So those are features that are already existent within eBook Central that we want to put within easy reach of, uh, of, of readers, of patrons, when they are using a book. Um, it will be available on subscribed and owned books. We're not going to make it available for, uh, available for titles that are available on, say, a demand-driven acquisition basis. We want to make sure that it's not necessarily driving any acquisitions or leading to any extra costs. It needs to be on a specific set of content. So we've made the decision for launch to make it available on those owned and subscribed books. As I mentioned, many publishers are participating. Um, there are some who have decided to opt out because it's not necessarily, it doesn't fit their strategy. Um, so we wanna make it as straightforward as possible for those publishers who want to opt out, they can do that. We also want to make sure that individual authors, uh, individual titles can be excluded as well. Uh, we know that some authors have concerns about how their material, how their content, how their books are being used. So again, we want to make that as straightforward as possible. And there will also be some customer configuration options. Uh, I did see a, a question about whether it's going to be possible to turn it on or off on a platform by platform basis, certainly within eBook Central, we want to provide an option that allows customers to opt in or opt out as is necessary. Um, and last point on this slide before I move into some of the more specific detail, I should stress we are working with a number of customers, a number of publishers as we develop, as we move forward with the research assistant to make sure that what we're delivering, um, certainly for launch and beyond, is what is right for them and what is right for their patrons and for their end users. So getting into some of the more detail as to what we're doing, um, 
talked already about insights at the chapter level. So as the uh, as a patron, as a student is working their way through a book, they will have very easy access to a uh, an AI generated takeaway for what that chapter is about. And that may be a few sentences, effectively um, providing the key themes of the, of the chapter. What is this chapter about? Why is it worth your while as a student to invest your time in reading through this chapter? For the most part, it's because you've been told to by an instructor, but we also want to kind of help, help a student make an informed choice um, as to whether or not they want to read it. Um, we will, um, as the user, um, as the patron works their way through the book, we'll also make it easy for them to see more insights, more takeaways um, as they move through onto different chapters. This is in contrast to some of our other research assistants on say the, uh, the progress platform where there are individual documents, say a journal article. But when it comes to books, we wanna make sure that we are providing something at the chapter level, which presents its own challenges because we need to make sure we're properly representing the navigation as the patron, as the user is moving through that book, chapter by chapter. They'll still be able to see the responses as they're generated for each previous chapter. They can move up and down within that research assistant panel. But certainly when it comes to viewing each chapter, they'll click a button and see an insight for each new chapter. So uh, if we move on to other features within our research assistant. So there's a takeaway that provides some themes. We also provide a uh, concepts uh, option. Now this extracts entities from within the chapter that may be named individuals, it may be organizations, it might be specific subjects, themes, um, and as the name suggests, concepts that are specific to the chapter. And we'll also be providing some definitions for each of those, uh, each of those entities. And again, those definitions are drawn from within the chapter. So it's not necessarily the uh, definitive definition of that concept, but it's the concept as it's being discussed within the chapter. So if you perhaps see the same term in a different book, you probably get, you will get a different definition because it is the definition relevant to what you are reading at the time you request it. Um, both of the insights and the concepts, our goal, our aim, as has already been stated, is to encourage the user, encourage the patron to engage more with the book, to get them into the book and potentially lead them on to other relevant sources. For each of these concepts, we're gonna be providing a search option that will take them out to related books, books that contain the same concepts, helping them to make those connections, helping, them, helping librarians as well, customers, to get the most out of their holdings, the books that they are providing to their students. And lastly, I mentioned uh, it's not all about AI. We are gonna be providing some curated features. So these are um, primarily the publisher provided description of the book. And we receive these today. We make these available on a different page within eBook Central. Um, they're there when the user first starts to view the book, decide that they want to read the book, but we don't present that as the user is actively reading the book. So we've decided to integrate that book description so that, again, as, as they are reading through the book, they can understand the context of what they're reading, understand what the book is about that may otherwise be, be missing to them. We also provide book subjects as well. Um, again, helping with the understanding of what the book is about, but also, if the user decides perhaps this book isn't for them, they can quickly and easily find related books that are also on the same subject elsewhere within the, within eBook Central. So really, as I say, our main aim with the eBook Central research is to help with an understanding of the book, help with an understanding of the chapter that's perhaps been assigned. Uh, and as I say, encourage, encourage the user to engage more with that content and understand why it's useful to them. Um, and perhaps in some cases why it's not useful and why they should be looking at something else instead. So that's a very quick run through of what we're aiming to achieve. Um, I'll now uh, hand it back, I believe to Tara and we'll um, set some questions. So thank you. Thanks Stuart. You 
sort of address two of the most popular questions, but if you want to just um, reiterate. So the first question that was upvoted was, my understanding is AI tech is qu quite costly, and they're wondering if there will be an added fee subscription cost for the AI functionality being added to the platforms. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that from the perspective of eBook Central, and then perhaps hand it over to Christina for a wider um, follow-up. But what we're aiming to do is make the research system free when we first launch it. Um, that will have uh, the capabilities that I've just been outlining. Um, we don't necessarily, yes, there is a cost. We will absorb that cost. We don't feel that it's fair or right to transfer that cost on to, to customers and certainly not to end users. That's certainly never been our model. Um, in future, um, there may be options, there may be a model that we will seek to uh, look at how we could charge for that. But let's say certainly initially and going forward for that this specific type of research assistant, there wouldn't be any charges to customers. But as I say, I'm only speaking for eBook Central, but Christina, I think you can provide some context for the wider um, academic platforms. Yeah, and the, the, the truth is that we're do, doing different things across different product lines, depending on how sophisticated the system is that we're building. So we have some solutions for which we are charging, and we have uh, some solutions, uh, most of them we're not charging anything right now, like Stuart was saying. Um, the moment we make those uh, those tools more sophisticated and, and those costs uh, increase significantly, we might need to rethink that, but that's a current policy right now. Thanks, Christina. Um, the second most popular question is, if you are using pre-trained LLMs, how do you control for quality? And I can answer that one too. Uh, so imagine what we're doing is we're using the LLM um, for, the, for its linguistic capabilities. Um, the LLM knows how to construct sentences that are grammatically correct, make sense, are appropriate to a particular audience. They know how to do all of that. What we're doing is feeding them our curated content to say, answer the question using this content. So they provide the linguistic features. So yeah, they they build the sentence, but they build the sentence using our content. So that's how we're using the LLM uh, and ensuring that it's not using the pre-trained data that, um, that it has always um, in its background. So I think that's the best comparison that I would, I would suggest. If I could add a little bit to that, I think another way that we're able to minimize hallucinations and, and things like that is by having a control, controlled and curated feature set. So as opposed to ChatGPT, where you can you know, ask it literally any question on earth, um, you'll notice that the features that we're launching with on eBook Central are a few, uh, a few features that we think are would be uniquely valuable for students that are, you know, the takeaways of each chapter and important concepts. We're able to really work behind the scenes on, on, on um, making sure that the output is exactly what we want it to be. And it, it is uh, credible and high quality. Um, so in a, in a con by doing this controlled rollout of features, rather than just having kind of an open-ended text box where you can just request anything, um, we have a lot more control over the output. Thanks, Stephen. We also somewhat addressed this question, but maybe we can elaborate on it, elaborate on it a little bit. Um, the question regarding whether uh, users will be able to opt out of these AI features based on, you know, maybe their policy at their universities. And that is something that we built for all of our tools, um, not for end users but for institutions. So they can all go um, and request that their account doesn't feature any AI tools if they don't want to. So that's a clear policy of us. Yeah. And that is presumably platform by platform, product by products as well. So it could be, you could have it on 
the progress platform say, but not on eBook Central or wherever else it appears. Correct. Great, thank you. I'm not sure if this is answered in the same way since it's just working off of our content, but how are you minimizing hallucinations and bias? Hallucinations by using that uh, rock architecture that we were talking about. And somebody in the chat pointed out that the way LLMs work, they just predicting words, right? So they don't really understand what they say. They just predicting words and that's why they can they come up with hallucinations. But if we guide them to use the content that we want them to use, that reduces the hallucinations significantly. And we've been able to test that across our different products. Um, bias, um, it has come up a lot in the chat. Uh, bias is different. And as somebody said, um, the content that you feed to the uh, LLM if the content is biased, your answers will be biased. And what we're trying to do is balance that content that we are sending as part of our um, RAG architecture. Again, the LLM is responding to these questions based on the curated content that we have. So we have already ensured that our content is as bias-free as possible, obviously, um, not 100% guaranteed, but we are curating our content and that's the content that goes into the responses. So that's our way of reducing the bias in, in these tools, basically. Thank you. I'm not sure if we can answer this next question, but have you tested the chapter insights with students? Do you find they're only reading the insights to quote and they're not reading the actual text? Um, we haven't done specific training we're, or testing with students yet, um, although that is planned. Um, I would say that in terms of the insights that we're providing, they are simply, they're a couple of sentences at most. So if a student was going to be using those sentences in their, in their research or their assignment, they'd have to be filling them out quite substantially um, in order to get much value from them. Um, obviously, that's not to say that there isn't value there. It's just they are intended as a tool, as a guide. They're not intended by any means to replace the student actually doing the work, do it, doing the evaluation themselves. So um, what we, one of the things we are going to be looking into is as well is how, how can it be um, effectively cited, um, the output from this tool? Uh, how can we make sure that we've got the proper attribution um, available with the app, with the AI outputs as well. So um, we'll be looking into that um, subsequently as well. But yeah, I, I would hope that um, any of the output that we provide, it's it, as I say, it's intended as a as a support. It's not intended as a replacement for any of the in individual research as an individual student's own work. Just as we've done, I think, with um, um, work for journal articles and other content, particularly on the ProQuest platform. Yeah, I can and, um, jump in there and, and just add um, a little bit of um, yeah, please. background on some of the user testing as well. Um, we, we've launched a, a similar research system on ProQuest uh, recently, and we've learned a lot from that as well. Um, that I think will translate a bit to what we're gonna find on the, on the eBook Central platform. And what we're finding is that the people that engage with some of the, these features actually spend more time on our platforms mm -hmm. and end up um, finding more documents and and not not just grabbing and going. And they're, they're still engaging with the content. So that's encouraging. And I'm, I expect that it will continue with that trend on, on books, despite it being a, you know, a different content type than what we find necessarily in the ProQuest platform. We also, also within the ProQuest platform, we are, we are asking students um, if they like the feature and why, and the most common um, reason is that it helped them evaluate the document. So um, there are users that spend a lot of time reading something only to find out that it doesn't contain what they were looking for. And that's a waste of time for them. They get frustrated and they leave. With these new tools, um, we give them the answer pretty quickly 
and they can move on to the next document pretty quickly without getting that frustration. Interestingly enough, um, the people that don't like uh, the tool are divided into two camps. The students tend to say that the key takeaways, those insights are too short. <laughs> They would like them to be longer so that they can just copy and paste them and put it in their work. But like Stuart was saying, this is just a very short sentence telling students what the document is about. On the other hand, we have the librarians that are complaining that we are providing too much information and we're doing the work for the students. So we have both camps there. Um, we have received, um, it's not massive, massive feedback right now, but um, it's been interesting to see that, that divide among the different groups. Thank you, Christina. Um, next question, are the concepts and insights stable or are they dynamically generated every time? Uh, they are dynamically generated every time. Um, there is also an element that I didn't mention, which is um, when a when a student has carried out a search within eBook Central, uh, we'll be carrying that search term through to the response. So it could well be that, let's say you have two students who are using the same, same book, same chapter, they could well see a slightly different takeaway um, because one takeaway is geared more towards the query of the, the first student, the first researcher. The second one is geared towards the query from the second researcher um, if they've not done any um, they've not done any search let's say they've come from an external source they followed a link into ebook central um, you've got five students looking at the same book they followed the same link they will they should see exactly the same takeaway the same insights within that panel um, we aren't going to be well we were thinking about caching the responses um, but at this stage, the overhead of doing that, it doesn't, doesn't quite justify caching the responses, storing them for future use. So every time somebody clicks on the show me a key takeaway button, they'll get a newly refreshed, uh, newly refreshed response. Thank you for that, Stuart. Just trying to scroll and see if there's any questions that we haven't addressed in other ways. Um, um, something we haven't touched on much is about the authors. Will authors get extra royalties if their work is being used um, this way by the program? That's something that we are, um, mm -hmm. we're actively engaged with publishers at the moment, um, discussing um, remuneration, royalties, um, licensing costs. Um, we aren't directly considering additional royalties at this stage, um, but that, that may change in the future, especially as publishers come up with their own, uh, own list of requirements. But um, certainly in terms of us making direct payments or direct royalties to authors, that's not something we're considering right now. Okay, let's see. I think we're almost at time, aren't we? So. Yeah, I'm like, I don't know if we have time for any more questions, just so we don't get cut off for time. So I think um, we, if we didn't get to your questions, we'll definitely follow up. I see some things are uh, great information for us to consider as we're still in development and we'll definitely take your questions and comments into consideration um, as we roll this out um, and any questions that we were unable to answer that we can answer at this time, we will follow up with you. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks so much, Tara. Uh, so thank you to Christina, Stephen, and Stuart for taking the time to speak with us today. And thank you to our attendees for your questions and your comments. I'd like to remind our viewers that we did record today's program, so be on the lookout for a follow-up email from Choice and ACRL with a link to the recording. Also, if you have a few minutes after the presentation to fill out a brief survey, we would really appreciate it. 
So thanks again to all of you out there for joining us. We hope you learned something new from the webinar and hope to see you again soon in another session. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.